Yo, what's up everybody, RageCage20 here, back with Mr. Bomb, but before we get into any of that, I got something I need to record here, to put in all my future stuff here, uh, I, got, I got a message to, uh, to people before you leave a comment, so uh, before you start smashing that skip button, you might want to listen to this, if you're those, uh, those people that have a few names for you, and I'm going to give them right now, uh, if you're one of those idiots, uh, douchebags, or horrible piece of shit trash human beings that uh, that leave comments like uh, oh you're not Mr. Ballin you're just stealing views from him and blah, 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 blah. you're horrible blah, blah. you need to listen to this okay because uh, if you don't if you skip this and then leave a stupid ass comment I am gonna drag your ass viciously in the comment section all right so you've been warned so I have a few things to go through here a checklist real quick to discuss about why what you're saying is wrong because I'm tired of hearing it. Uh, it doesn't happen often. It happens maybe like one person, like per video, gets ballsy and says some shit. And for the most part, it's positive. Lots of likes on these videos and stuff like that. And I appreciate all you who are positive and who aren't idiots. But for you who are idiots, I have a message for you. I got a checklist here to get through. So, first two things to kind of interweave with each other um, Mr. Ballin's doing fine, guys. Mr. Vaughn financially is doing fine. Homie's got over 8 mil subs. Dude's getting millions and millions of views per video. Dude is, he's getting his checks. Right? He's getting his money. Don't you fucking worry about it. All right? He's getting paid. And he's, it's not like he's getting money or food stolen off his plate from all these reaction videos. He's getting his fat YouTube checks. Don't fucking worry about that. Homie's well off. If he wasn't, he specifically, every creator can make it so that these videos get instantly blocked. Mr. Ballin leaves it specifically on his channel that allows people to use his content. He's okay with it, alright? If he wasn't, he could block these instantly very easily if it was actually taking money from him. So keep that in mind. Also, I'm not watching these when they're being released. It'd be one thing if this had, like, a video had come out like an hour ago and I was, like, jumping on it to try to wriggle them out of some views or something. This has been out for months and months and months. He's already gotten his money, okay? At this point, I'm not stealing anything from Mr. Ballin. Which brings me to the next two all points together. Because um, usually I school people with this and they don't have got nothing to say. So, like, I'm, again, I'm trying to save you. Um... This isn't uh, the situation which one person yelled at me. You're like, XQC, you just steal stuff. Uh, which I guess this will bring in another point here. Um, there are some reaction channels out there that do uh, just watch stuff. Either don't say anything or just keep repeating the same stuff. XQC and Sniper Wolf are under heavy fire from a lot of people because of this. Um, I'm like Asmongold. You know it's a cage video when I'm double to over double the length of the original video. That means there is more than enough of my own point of view and viewpoints in here to make it a transformed and customized content, all right? So I'm not just watching it, just sitting here mindlessly just watching it, not saying shit, and then just cutting the video and moving on to the next one. I'm actually interjecting thoughts and opinions and transforming the content so there's that uh for people who've mentioned that but also this is not that kind of xqc who's a, a massive sub channel stealing from lesser sub people so more people are likely to watch him i don't know if you noticed i got 1000 subscribers i i ain't got much i am like still in views like most of these videos only get between maybe 500 to a thousand views for mr ballin okay I'm not really, st that's like a, a small penny drop in the bucket compared to the money that Mr. Bullen be making, okay? And secondly, and most importantly, for those who say that I just try to steal this for money and for fame and for subs and stuff, first off, as I mentioned to someone else, I don't want subscribers. Like, if you sub to me, that's cool. But, like, I don't ever want to get over 100,000. The only reason that's 100,000 is because a uh, play button would be cool. Just for, you know, when I get older, my kids are like, tell us about the past. And be like, there's this thing called YouTube. Y'all don't know about it anymore, but like, I got that bitch. That would be kind of cool. 
But and I'll but if that wasn't the case, I'd maybe want somewhere between ten to fifty thousand tops. Like I don't do this for subs. Um I don't want a lot of subs. I don't want a lot of attention. I just want a nice small community that I can talk to and build community with. There's people I recognize that come back and comment and stuff, and I love building this community, being able to talk to people and having a fun time. You can't do that if you have a lot of subs. I don't want a lot of subs, and I am not at the current moment and uh, never have nor never will be monetized for my videos. I don't make a fucking penny off of these, so I'm really not stealing anything from Mr. Ball. <laughs> so that's not an issue if you're worried about that i do this for fun not for profit and fame okay cool uh also this this kind of stuff has been going on for years back in the back in the 50s in the 1950s you might have heard of him do call frank sinatra one of probably hundreds of people that literally got famous and are well known for singing songs they didn't write other people wrote these songs and they would do covers of them and get famous off of that. That's been happening since the 50s. Do the math. That was a long time ago. Then around early 2Ks, late 90s, early 2Ks, doing covers and stuff. When YouTube came out especially, doing covers of songs is how a lot of people like Jonathan Young got famous. Like, this has been going on forever. There's also been parodies of TV shows and movies going on forever. We're just taking other people's content technically. Uh, in the rap, hip hop, R and B kind of game, like they will take samples from well known stuff and make songs out of it. There's one that uses the SpongeBob theme. I don't know what any of these songs are called. There's one that uses the theme from Kill Bill. Uh there's one that takes the Numa Numa song. Uh I think that's what it's called. <laughs> uh and made a song about that, like this kind of transformative content stuff has been happening forever. Now, I know some people don't like reaction videos. Some people don't understand the concept of it and its purpose. Same thing happened with Let's Plays and stuff when video games were, well, Let's Plays were hot on YouTube. People didn't understand it. And you know what? It is totally okay if you don't understand it. There is nothing wrong with that. However, you need to be mature and you need to be a fucking adult and understand like, okay, well, it's not for me, but I'm not going to harass other people that it is for or that like doing it because I just don't like it. It's not for me. I'll move the fuck on. Example, I don't really care for OnlyFans or simping and stuff like that. I think it's kind of a horrible practice and I disagree with it. However, I'm not going to go find OnlyFans people and scream and yell at them and harass them because they choose to do it. Guess what? It doesn't affect me in life. I can move the fuck on. Be a fucking adult. Move the fuck on, okay? I don't need to hear about it. And I don't give a shit. <laughs> um, and if that still doesn't satisfy your stupid fucking mind, here's try this on size. There's very few people that watch my stuff before watching Mr. Bollins, but there are a handful of people who have mentioned to me that they do something like that. Guess what? To everybody who's watching this, go watch the original. Even if you don't want to hear the story and you want to hear it from me f for some reason first, go play it, let it play, mute it, let it play while you're watching mine. And let it get through. Give Mr. Ballin your views, give him the the uh, the analytics of it going all the way through, Like help him with that algorithm. You know, Go watch the original content, then come back and watch mine. Alright, cool, we good? Alright, can you fuck off? <laughs> uh, and to all the people who don't like long reaction videos and you decided I'm gonna click on this video that's probably an hour long to watch <clears throat> uh, and so I decided to watch my stuff even though they're, they're just like I don't like when people pause and talk over stuff but this is an hour long so that he means he probably didn't pause and talk about it so I'm gonna watch it first off you, you need to get you need to like something's wrong with your fucking brain you need to fix yourself so you should probably go worry about that than what's going on with my channel but guess what we're gonna pause a fuck ton here so if you're not ready for that leave and guess what if you don't like me doing a reaction mr ballin leave and on your way out you can even slam the fuck out of that dislike button cool man i don't give a fuck but don't fucking at me in the comments or I'm gonna fucking rip your head off okay okay cool thank you so we are here today this video is with this demon still lives among us. 
Uh, now I, after that intro there, I am going to probably start, I might cut down parts of that and start putting it at the beginning of like every single one of these videos. Uh, but I will start putting in, uh, at least some timestamps so that if you've either already seen it once or you don't want to see it, you can skip it. Uh, so you know where to skip to or whatnot. So yes, this demon still is among us. Uh, the... The, the the thumbnail to me the dude looks like uh murray i think his name's murray right <laughs> uh murray from impractical jokers so i don't, <laughs> I don't know what's going on except with glasses and whatnot so that's kind of interesting but i don't know who this is i have no idea who it could be about but we've already spent enough time this is probably going to be very long so let's not waste any more time let's bring it on down here mr ball and this demon still lives among us if you skip the intro seriously go give mr b some love go watch this video go put it on repeat like throughout the day give him views on views on views so that people stop bitching about you taking views from mr ball and, like go do that for me like if every one of you at least goes and plays at one time and just lets it run you can mute it and do whatever the fuck else you want like give him some love all right <laughs> people get off my fucking nuts so I don't have to yell at people in the comments. Let's go. Brought to you by HelloFresh. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, and today we're going to look at three stories that demonstrate that. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please go to the like button's place of work one minute before closing time, and oh, then proceed to no. browse around for about 30 minutes, and, and then, then leave without buy buying anything. anything. Also, please subscribe uh, to our channel and turn on all notifications. Uh, it's fucking brutal. <laughs> That's cold, man. That's cold. So you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. I still have absolutely no idea what this story's even gonna be related to. Is it a serial killer? Is it someone who shot the oh, three stories? Oh, this is a three-parter. Oh, I did not see that one coming. All right, memories. I'm, I'm, in, I'm here for it. In 1957, 31-year-old Larry Bader was living with his wife, Mary Lou, and their that three kids that. in Akron, Ohio. Larry was a good father and good husband, but he was a terrible businessman. Over the past several years, he had launched several new business ventures, and they had all failed, throwing the family into fairly significant debt. And so even though Larry desperately wanted to be an entrepreneur and eventually start a quality business, they didn't have the money to do that. And so he had to just take some job in order to pay the bills. And so the job he got was a cookware salesman for a local company, and it did pay the bills, but it did not make Larry happy. And so on the weekends when Larry was not working, and if it was okay with his wife... Hold on a second. Is that Alice Cooper? Dog, let's go. He would basically just disappear and go fishing on Lake Erie, which is about an hour north of where they lived. And that was his way of kind of disconnecting from reality and kind of disconnecting from his somewhat crappy life. And so on Friday, March 15th, Larry approached his wife and said, hey, you know, I'd like to head up to Lake Erie and go fishing for the weekend. And she would tell him, you know, I got the kids. It's fine. You can go do that. But I heard the weather was going to be really bad. Are you sure that's such a good idea? And Larry would tell her, you know what? Don't worry about it. These storms, they always hype them up. They're never a big deal. I'll be fine. And so he kissed his wife. He kissed his kids. He grabbed his stuff. He hopped in his truck Then he left and headed up to Lake Erie. That night, Lake Erie was hit with a massive thunderstorm, way bigger than the one that the news was predicting. And then the following morning, okay. the Coast Guard discovered Larry's boat floating around on Lake Erie. There was minor damage to it, and it was missing an oar, and it was missing Larry. Larry was nowhere to be found. And so a search was launched for Larry, but he was never found, and he was eventually declared dead. And so even though the family did not have Larry's body, they would hold a funeral for him, and his wife was able to actually cash his life insurance policy, which was enough to pay for her and the kids. Eight years later, in 1965... Uh... So first off, Lake Erie. Like, Erie's in the name. Like, you, that's just a foreboding place to go to in general. I'd say, nah. But, uh... Also, there was this meme, uh, or, the, or TikTok or something, I don't know, a video uh, that went that I saw somewhere. Uh, uh, there's, like, clearly the younger girl dating. Ah, that's fine. You don't. Oh, I, was, I remember someone saying that that was going to happen. Oh, that was loud. Whew. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, young girl <laughs> dating this clearly way like over her age kind of older dude you know 
trying to trying to get that money and whatnot. And then he was talking about how he didn't have a <laughs> didn't have a life plan or what have you. And just her face was like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah, no, I'm not gonna pay for that." <laughs> Immediate like you regret your choices. Uh, like yeah suspicious you know he had all that you know he wasn't making a lot of money he was leaving a lot of the time you know huge storm coming in coincidence here maybe maybe the wife was looking for a little bit of that insurance money maybe you know she snorkeled up all like uh navy seal style like jumped on the boat pop pop and you know took the body down with her you know something like that you know suspicious i'm just throwing it out there Larry Bader's niece, a 21-year-old woman named Suzanne Peka, was in Chicago at a sporting goods show with a friend of hers. And as they're walking through the different exhibits, looking at different sporting goods equipment, they noticed over on the side of the building, there was a fairly large group of people gathered around this one particular exhibit. And so she and her friend she was with walked over to this group and they kind of pushed their way through. And in the middle of this group was this man with an eye patch and a big mustache doing an archery demonstration. Basically, he was shooting arrows into a target about 30 the home dude fake his own death <laughs> and then put on a disguise so he could go back to his entrepreneurial ways and now he's trying to sell bows or some shit <laughs> feet away. And so Suzanne and her friend just kind of watched this guy for a couple of minutes and very quickly they could see why he was attracting this big crowd because he was just an incredible archer. He was hitting the bullseye over and over and over again. But as they continued to watch this guy, Suzanne's friend started to notice something unique about him. And he eventually turned to Suzanne and said, hey, doesn't this guy look exactly like your uncle who went missing on Lake Erie? And Suzanne was kind of surprised to hear him talking about her missing uncle, but she turned and looked at this guy and all of a sudden she saw it too. He was a spitting image of Larry Bader, her uncle. Although this guy had an eye patch and a mustache, but even with that, he looked exactly like Larry. Because <laughs> you can't buy those or grow those. Well, at least one of those. Larry. And as Suzanne is watching him, she's thinking, you know, Larry was known for being this incredible archer. No and here this guy is who looks just like him, no and he's way. an incredible archer. And so after this demonstration was over, Suzanne and the friend ran over to this guy with the eye patch on. And Suzanne says to him, Hey, I know this sounds totally crazy, but you look exactly like my uncle, Larry Bader, who went missing on Lake Erie eight years ago. And so the guy, he hears her and he kind of smiles and says, You know, I'm sorry. I I don't know Larry Bader. My name is John Johnson. <laughs> Bro, if this is actually not him, that is one hell of a coincidence <laughs> that his name is so. Oh, it's John. John son. Yeah, John Johnson. Yeah, that that's my, that's my name. Johnny real name over here. That's me. This is definitely not a fake name and identity. Like, I'm really hoping the twist is it's not this dude, because otherwise it's like, bro, you didn't even try. <laughs> I, I I'm sorry. I don't I don't know who your uncle is. I I can't help you. But Suzanne, as she stood there staring at this guy, she was becoming more and more convinced this was Larry Bader, despite the fact this guy is saying he is not Larry Bader. And so she says to him. No, you are Larry Bader. I'm I'm positive. You're No, I'm um, Tim Timothy. Uh Sam Samson. That's 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 me. <laughs> Sam Sam. Everyone knows Sam Sam. Tim Tim? John John? That's clearly no, that's not me. I'm not no Bader. Or my uncle. Now at this, Fritz would be polite but firm, and he would reiterate that look, I'm not your uncle. I don't know who Larry Bader is. I don't go to Lake Erie. I, I just don't understand why you think I'm him. I live in Omaha, Nebraska with my wife and my kids, and I'm on TV. I, I do sports journalism in Omaha, and I advise archery companies, and that's that's why I'm here. So I, I don't know why you think I'm your uncle, but 
I'm not. I'm sorry. And with that, oh. Fritz turned around and he walked away. And after this discussion, Suzanne and her friend were not remotely deterred from what Fritz was saying. They yeah. were completely convinced this was Larry yeah. Bader. And so they ran to a phone and Suzanne called her two other uncles, so Larry Bader's brothers, and she explained how she met this guy that is the spitting image of their brother. And they immediately hopped on a flight that night and flew to Chicago. And the following morning, Damn. the two uncles, along with Suzanne and her friend. They went back to the sporting goods show. They went over to the archery exhibit and sure enough there was Fritz doing his archery demonstration and as soon as there was a break, Suzanne, her friend, and now the two uncles, so Larry Bader's brothers, they walk over and the two uncles, as soon as they see this guy despite the eye patch, despite the mustache, they too would say this is our brother. And so they approached him and they said, look, I know you're saying you are not our brother. I don't know what's going on here, but you look exactly like our brother. And we have his military paperwork right here with fingerprints. Will you please just humor us and go to the police station with us and get fingerprinted? That way you can prove you really are not our brother. Please, we've been looking for our brother for a long time. This would be a huge favor to us. And so Fritz was annoyed. He didn't want to do it, but he's like, okay, fine. I'll go to the police station with you. I'll get my fingerprints taken and we can put this behind us. And so that day they and left the Sporting Good Show. Back. They went to a police station and Fritz had his fingerprints taken. And afterwards the police would tell him, you are Larry Bader. When Fritz heard this, huh. he could not believe it. I mean, he literally did not believe he was Larry Bader. It wasn't like this revelation prompted new memories and suddenly he recalled it all. It was really the opposite. Yeah, Fritz immediately is trying to rack his brain to figure out, like, is my whole life a lie? But there was nothing. All he had was a contiguous stretch of memories from when he was a very young child as Fritz Johnson all the way to the present. But we now know that the bulk of his memories are all not real. He was never a child as Fritz Johnson. He was Larry Bader and then became Fritz Johnson only eight years earlier. The timeline of what happened to Larry Bader is rough at best. But as far as we understand it, Fritz Johnson showed up in Omaha, Nebraska a couple of days or a couple of months after Larry Bader went missing on Lake Erie. And when Fritz showed up in Omaha, he just walked into a restaurant and asked for a job there. And he had provided documentation that showed he was in fact Fritz Johnson. And nobody thought anything of it. He was completely normal. There was nothing unusual about his behavior. And over time, Fritz just kind of thread himself into the Omaha community. I mean, he got married, he had a child, he adopted another child, he left his job as a bartender at a restaurant and eventually got this amazing job as a sports TV broadcaster for their local channel. I mean, he was like a minor celebrity in Omaha. Everybody recognized, oh, there's Fritz Johnson. He's on TV. Hey, Fritz, how you doing? I mean, he had a full-blown life. But as soon as the news broke that he was not Fritz Johnson, he was Larry Bader, right away, the TV station he worked yeah. for fired him. His uh, second you know, wife sure. left him because <clears throat> in reality, he actually was... Yeah, if he, if, if he is actually <laughs> Larry, um, then that other marriage is not actually legitimate. He's not actually married. Um, he got, what did they say, it was eight months or something like that? He got married in under eight, eight months? God damn. <laughs> A girl fell hard or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I'm waiting for the twist here, which like, oh, he hit his head and had amnesia, and he just thought he was Larry. Excuse, excuse, what, what happened? still legally married to his first wife and so his marriage to his second wife was never actually real to begin with right. and so she leaves him and then also because Larry Bader was no longer dead the insurance company that had paid out Ooh. all that money to his Did first wife as part of his life insurance policy they demanded that he repay them. And throughout all this drama of Fritz finding out he's Larry Bader, Fritz continued to say he was not Larry Bader, that this was all a big mistake. He just could not understand how this could have happened. None of it made sense. And so eventually a team of experts, doctors, psychologists, you name it, they came out to Omaha and they ran Fritz, AKA Larry Bader, through a battery of tests over almost two weeks. And at the end of all their 
testing, they concluded that one, Fritz definitely is Larry Bader. So there's no debate there. He is Larry Bader. And two, he is almost certainly suffering from an extreme case of amnesia, which is memory loss. But okay. the doctors and experts how? had no idea how he developed this case of amnesia. And of course, Fritz, he too had no idea how he developed this case of amnesia. And it's unlikely we'll ever get any more clarity on exactly what happened to Larry Bader slash Fritz, because unfortunately, just one year after it was discovered Fritz was Larry Bader, Fritz would die. He had mm. cancer in one of his eyes, and that was actually why he wore that eye patch, right. and the cancer had come back, and it took his Lawrence. life. Today, his case is considered to be one of the most believable and baffling cases of amnesia on record. <laughs> Maybe it had something to do with the tumor in his eye or something. That's, um... Huh. Okay. I I really don't know what to say about that. Like that's fast excuse me, fascinating as fuck. Um uh, how confusing would that be? Like you've been like you, whoever's watching this, have been living your whole life and all of a sudden someone comes up to you and's like No, you're not this person, you're this person. You're just like No and then you go get tested and like literally authorities and doctors and stuff saying like, No, you are you would think you've gone crazy, right? You would think that like there's some kind of conspiracy against you and people are trying to frame you for something or or have something happen to you, you know? I mean, like, this is the movies. You know, it's just like in the movies. Like, that would be fucking wild. So, uh, yeah, sucks. <clears throat> sucks to be Larry. <laughs> it's crazy, man. I what is this second story? Before we get into our next oh, story, yeah, yeah, I want to talk sure. to you about today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Back during the... We haven't got to the demon yet. Haven't got to the demon yet. Prize gifts. Okay, back to the stories. Bungie. Okay, okay, okay. Just outside of the popular tourist town of Amaga in northern Colombia lies this thick green jungle. And if you know where to look, there is actually a walking path that leads you from Amaga deep Tons into this jungle. And if you keep going, it will bring you all the way to this terrifying, enormous old railroad bridge that spans this huge ravine. Now, this bridge... For a second, I thought my chair was squeaking. I thought I was squeaking my chair because I could hear that sound, but... I think that's Mr. Ball's chair again. It doesn't squeak often, at least I notice, but like occasionally I'll hear his, his chair that he's in because he's, he moves. He's very, very action packed with his hands and whatnot. The is no longer used by trains, it's been decommissioned. However, since it's decommissioning, there's actually been, ironically, more traffic on this bridge, although it is the foot traffic variety. People come out to this bridge to go bungee jumping. Bungee jumping is a thrill-seeking activity where people will leap off of high places, like this bridge, and they'll jump with an elastic rope tied to their ankles. And so this rope has been very carefully measured so that when it is fully stretched all the way out, it ensures whoever has jumped will still not impact the ground. Back in early July of 2021, a 25-year-old Colombian lawyer named Yesenia Gomez, who lived about an hour north... <clears throat> Hello. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, bungee dumping is kind of a risk in general. It's it's like one of those like kind of like parachuting and stuff. It's like Eight or nine times out of ten, well, probably higher success rate than that, but let's just give it around a 90, whatever that percentage is, or the numbers are. Let's like, give it like a 90 to 95% chance that, like, it's going to be totally fine. It's perfectly going to work. But there's that one in however much chance that is, like, you know, it's not going to work. It's either going to come undone, uh, the line might snap, it might not have been measured correctly so it will bungee you back after your face is slammed into the earth uh and continue to slam you a few more times um like it's 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 it, you're taking a risk if you do it in the first place in a place that um i don't want to say third world or anything i don't know necessarily know if it's that bad but like a, some areas kind of run down um I think you're taking quite a great risk trying to bungee off of this dilapidated bridge 
in a place where there's not, um, let's say, stricter uh, codes and standards for what is safe and what is not. So I feel like I know where this story going, but uh, he's in, yeah, how you doing? Okay. With of Amaga in the larger city hmm. of Medellin, she told her boyfriend that she wanted to go oh. bungee jumping. This was something <laughs> Senia had talked about for a long time, wanting to go bungee jumping. But every time it became a real thing and they were actually going to go do it, she would back down because she was just too scared. But sure. for whatever reason, in July of 2021, Yesenia had the confidence and the courage to actually see this thing through. And so her boyfriend, when he heard how serious she was, he capital. Uh, what's the what's the name of boyfriend here? Because I mean, yes, but like, hey, how you, <laughs> this is just a good looking couple right here on the opportunity because he had never bungee jumped before and he really wanted to but he couldn't without his girlfriend and so now it seemed like she was serious and so right away he called the Amaga bungee jumping company to book a slot for he and Yasinia to jump off of their bridge. So on sure. the day they were supposed to jump which was Sunday July 18th Yasinia and her boyfriend hopped in their car and they drove an hour south to Amaga and when they got there they found the walking trail and they made their way out to this bridge and when they get out to this bridge they are amazed at the the number of people who were already in line on this bridge waiting to jump off of it they knew this was again i don't I, I, this looks like the spot because i think i see the cubes i don't know how far this goes down but this does not look far enough for a bungee cord <laughs> as it's a small ass bungee cord and you just kind of dangle a little bit here like it looks like if you look at the slope of where the ground is here that does not look tall enough for bungee <laughs> like, at all the popular spot but perhaps they didn't realize just how popular it was and so yasinia and her boyfriend they get in line behind the nearly 100 other jumpers ahead of them and they proceed to wait and over the next several hours, Yasinia mm. and her boyfriend would have front row seats to all of the jumpers ahead of them jumping off the bridge. Now, it seems like Yasinia, in her mind, believed she would arrive at this bridge and very quickly okay. she and her boyfriend would leap off and it would be great and so much fun. But now they've been forced to wait for a really long time. Yeah. And this whole time, they're watching other people jump. And Yasinia is starting to panic. Suddenly, yeah, bungee jumping just... looks terrifying. Yeah, that's just not long enough, man. <laughs> like, and did you see the propulsion of which that lady came back? Like, she almost came back, first off, went down this direction. It looked like that lady was about to smack into the underside of that fucking bridge. Like, hell no, nah, you could not pay me. You could. You could pay me enough, but you would have to pay me. We're talking at least 100 grand plus. Like... <laughs> to go off of that. Fuck no. Fuck no. It did not look. Hold on, give me that again. Starting to panic. Suddenly, bungee jumping looked terrifying. It did not. If she didn't hit that bridge, she got that close, man. <laughs> what the fuck? look like something she wanted to do and so she was beginning to second guess her decision oh so hell no he's trying to calm her down and he's telling her oh it's totally safe look at all these people oh, well, who have other jumped. People they're all alive. fine they're all yeah. smiling they're so happy you're gonna be so proud of yourself but despite uh, his best efforts to calm his girlfriend down yasinia just could not calm down but she did tell her boyfriend that she's not about to back down she's gonna go through with yo, this and so she she ain't no wuss she ain't no bitch uh, her, her mom didn't raise no bitch. She over for it. You know what? Respect. You might die, but respect. Several hours went by of this totally high stress, anxious waiting period. And then finally, Yasinia and her boyfriend reached the front of the line, <sighs> at which point the staff members who've been doing this all day long, they signal the two to step forward and get their harnesses on. And so Yasinia and her boyfriend, they make their way to the edge of the platform. So they're looking out Fuck over this ravine no. and the staff members are putting on their harnesses and getting them ready. And the whole time Yasinia, she's starting to get tunnel vision. Her heart is racing. She's totally panicked. She doesn't think this is fun at all. She just wants to get this over with. And then at some point. I mean, I know the thrill will change your mind and whatnot, but like. Like, guys, if something, like, is just not funny, you don't have to do it. Especially when it's elective like this. Like, you don't you don't have to do it, you know? You know what I mean? If you're not even having fun at that point, like, 
unless it's like I have to prove this to myself kind of thing. Uh, you don't have to do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I wouldn't, I wouldn't call her a bitch if she didn't do it. I would call her uh, fucking smart <laughs> if she didn't do it. So like, like ain't, ain't no one around here gonna call you bitch, girl. Like you ain't checking it out. One of the staff members finally says, okay, jump. And so Yasinia jumps. Except it would turn out Yasinia had made a mistake. That staff member who had said, okay, jump, was talking to her boyfriend. Oh, boyfriend. <laughs> oh no. Like, oh my god. So again, rules and regulations and safety precautions in place. Anyone who was trying to get her ready, there should have been someone there. When someone else is calling jump, they're them to be grabbing by like, not you. No no not you, not you, not you. Like again, when those when those extra safety precautions aren't there in some other countries and stuff, like it's dangerous to do this kind of shit, you know what I mean? But technically, the guy was like, not you, as she's falling to her death. <laughs> like, what are you supposed to do? I, said, I wasn't talking to you. Not Yasinia. Uh, However, Yasinia, in her totally panicked state, had just not understood and had leapt, believing they were telling her to jump. However, the staff members had only put her harness on. Uh, they had not attacked. Oh, my God. She's going to... I mean, it's not high enough to splat, but... Those are rocks down there. She's gonna break everything. Like she's probably dead on impact still, even though she won't splatter, but attached the actual elastic rope to her ankles. And so when Yasinia jumped, there was nothing stopping her from smashing into the ground. And so as soon as she leapt off the bridge, her boyfriend ripped off all of his gear and he ran down the bridge. He leapt Oh I, I, if I was my doubt <laughs> Like if he was ready to jump, he was good to go and She's jumping. I would have jumped in her direction to try to grab her. Probably wouldn't have worked, but like that's at least something instead of just like I gotta go down and see the the destruction and carnage down there. Like homie wasn't like ready for like save. You know I gotta save. Like he was just like, well she's dead. Hold on, let me go run down here and get her. Like I would have I would have made a jump for her. Like it's very po I mean he weighs more so he would pick up velocity faster. And there's a chance he could get around her without dropping her. But at least if he at least got a hold of her, even if she slipped, it would decrease the velocity at which she was traveling a little bit. And she would probably only end up with maybe broken legs. Um, maybe paralyzed, but probably alive. So, yeah, he should have left for her. <laughs> Not uh, been like, N N JK, I'm... <laughs> Leapt over the railing and he ran down the hillside all the way to the well, bottom did, of this man. ravine. She's but when he finally dead. got to his girlfriend, it was already too late. She was already gone. 100%. It would later be determined Yasinia did not die from impacting the ground. What? She actually died from a heart attack. She's. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey. She died before she made impact. That's actually the best case scenario out of that because, yeah. Like, she probably died twice the second she hit there. Like, she would have definitely been dead. Um, but, yeah. Do you, do you think she knew that she wasn't bungeed? Or did she just die? He, Mr. Ball might explain this here in a second. But did she just... She would have died regardless because she was so scared. And her heart just gave up. Wow, it's so fucked. Now, someone has also commented before in a past video. Just like, why is this guy laughing? Uh, when tragic shit happens, uh, I'm a, I'm a weird I'm a weird bird, as they might say in uh, the UK. But like they would be talking about a woman. But regardless, I'm gonna use the term anyways. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a weird bird over here. Um, uh, dark humor is very uh, entertaining to me, and when it's someone I don't know personally, like my heart does go out for them. That's tragic, but it's already happened long ago it's already way past and i don't know them so this is like extreme dark humor and i guess my response is um to find the the, the, the humor in there uh so uh my bad suffered on the fall down which means she must have realized after she jumped oh they have a video i mean she either realized it or was just gonna die regardless but 
they, wow, we've never I've never seen one of these warnings in the middle of the video. Oh my god. Oh, okay. Prepare myself. Prepare myself. Okay. Wow, this is gonna be fucked. On the fall down, which means she must have realized after she jumped that she jumped too early, that she did not have the bungee cord attached to her legs. And so, okay, it was just the photo. I thought this was a video. Literally, the fear of what was about to happen to her killed her. Y'all motherfuckers are like warning, this is distressing. Like, yeah, the whole story was distressing. Like, we already had a mental image of what that looked like. That's just a photo. I thought it was gonna be literally a video. Of, like, that would have been distressing. <laughs> That's why I had to prepare myself. Like, holy shit. <laughs> okay, 37 daemons. Um, this is the one, I imagine, as this demon. Still lives among them, but I wonder if this is like, like the seventy-two virgins, but like the thirty-seven demons version. I'm interested. Wow, that's a fucked up story, by the way. That's real fucked. In up. early 1974, thirty-one-year-old Michael Taylor was living happily with his wife Christine and their five children in Osset, which is a small town in central England. Michael was described as a great father and a great husband who had an excellent sense of humor. In fact, neighbors, whenever they would walk past the Taylor household, would say you could often hear the sound of Michael laughing or the sound of him telling jokes to his family. But in April of that year, everything changed for the Taylor family. Michael had been doing some home repairs when he fell off of a ladder and he hurt his back. The injury itself was fairly minor, but it resulted in chronic pain. And this chronic pain quickly changed how Michael behaved. Michael went from being this cheerful, funny, happy guy to being sad and depressed. And he was so irritable that his family could barely be around him because he would lash out at them. Now, the uh. Taylor family was not a religious family. However, most families who lived in Osset at that time were. And so when one of Michael's friends found out about how poorly Michael was doing, they approached Michael and said, you know, you really ought to turn to religion for help and... Lord, Lord's gotcha. Um, yeah, no, uh, constant pain. Like, if you're always... Sorry, I heard a thump, but I just had to listen. Let's see if we continue. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're constantly in pain and you're always in pain and whatnot, like, that can completely change your mood and, like, outlook on life and everything. Like, someone experiencing constant pain of some sort will definitely change things. I think our, by the way, sorry if you can hear barks and stuff, I think our neighbor got a new dog and like, only, to be fair, only once a day, but at least like once, maybe twice a day sometimes, but like only once or twice a day, the dog will see somebody and bark really loud and guardly at them. So if that ever happens, my bad. For guidance in this difficult time. And they also told him specifically that he really ought to check out this one particular Christian group. It was called the Christian Fellowship Group. And all it was, was a prayer group. Uh, sounds like a recruitment right here um, for these uh, demons. Uh, I don't think it's going to end well. For Christians who wanted more religious support beyond just going to church on Sundays. But this friend of Michael's told him that the real draw of this group was the group's leader. Her name was Marie Robinson, and she was this 21-year-old, extremely friendly and energetic and charismatic person. Is it a cult? That <laughs> sounds like a cult who just had this incredible way of making all of her members really feel like they belonged. And so Michael's friend was telling him that he really thought Marie could be the difference maker for him, that she could help him get back to normal. Sorry for, keep, for constantly pausing here, just having little thoughts and I want to interject them here. Um, I don't know if I already said this, but like, it sounds like a recruiter. Like this guy sounds like a recruiter. And so Michael, you know, he trusted this friend and he really didn't have much to lose at this point. He was already at rock bottom. And so he agrees to go check this group out. So on September 12th of that year, Michael makes his way to the church where this fellowship group is held. He goes inside and he makes his way to one of the back rooms in the church. And when he goes inside, he sees there's a ring of people sitting in a circle, about 20 people. And as soon as they see Michael coming in the room, they all stand up and they open their arms up. And they say, come on, come sit down with us. Welcome, welcome to the group. 
group. And then the woman who had to be Marie, she stands up and she looks at Michael, huge smile on her face, and she encourages him to come over and sit right next to me. Welcome, we'd love to have you join our group. And so Michael, for the first time in ages, is smiling as he strides across the room and sits down right next to Marie. And then as Marie began to lead the group in prayer, Michael did not feel his chronic pain. He just felt happy again. But when the meeting was over and Michael went back home again, the pain and depression came flooding back. It was like the only place he could be happy was inside of the church at this fellowship group. And so over the next couple of weeks, Michael completely prioritized this group. He went to all of their meetings. And over the course of these couple of weeks, Michael became very close with Marie. And apparently Marie became very close with Michael to the point where the two of them would stay after, after the meetings were over. And just those two would sequester themselves in quiet prayer. No one knew what they did in there, but it just seemed like they were developing a real relationship. Sorry. Uh, <sighs> the random crazy, the, the intrusive thoughts kicked in. Is like, oh, I'm sure there's a lot of praying going on there. I think she's saying, oh my God, several times, if you know what I'm saying. <clears throat> Anyways. Oh, sorry. My also thoughts were uh, that he leaves his family, they become a thing, and they, he starts to like, we really have a control of these people. Let's really control them. Like I think he, well, they might start kicking the wheels in gear here, but I don't know, it's just a theory. And in fact, many people in this group suspected they were having an affair. Mm -hmm. Before long, the rumors in the church had spread outside and were all over Osset. And then before long, Christine, Michael's wife, was hearing from a friend or a neighbor that apparently Michael was having an affair with Marie. Now, Lots Christine had already Lots suspected her husband was having an affair with Marie because Marie was the only thing Michael talked about Ooh. when he got home. Yeah, so on look, October 1st look. of that year, only a couple of weeks after Michael had first attended this group, Christine waited until Michael had left the house to head out to one of the group meetings. And then Christine hopped in her car and she followed him to the church. And when she got there, she parked her car, she took a deep breath, and then she got out. She made her way to the front doors of the church and she stormed inside and she found the room where these meetings were held. She barges in and she points at her husband and she says, I know you're having an affair with Marie. Then you're gonna admit it in front of this whole group. And Michael, who's sitting with his back to his wife in one of the chairs, I mean, this is a bold strategy. My thought what she was going to do was going to come in. Like, after you know, wait, after the prayer group left when they were there for silent prayer, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't so silent, if you know what I'm saying. Um, she was going to bust in and catch them in the act. But she's just going to be like, I'm going to call you out for all everybody, bitch. You're going to admit right now you fucking this hoe. <laughs> like, ballsy ballsy especially if this is a cult they might turn on her real fast like she might not make it out of there alive um hmm he stands up and instead of addressing his wife who's accused him of infidelity he turns and looks shut the doors lock him watch it watch at Marie on the other side of the room. And when Marie made eye contact with Michael, she screamed. She would later say, Michael did not look human. He looked like a beast and he had wild eyes. And so as Michael is standing there staring Wait, at what? Marie with this very aggressive face, he began breaking out in tongues. Speaking in tongues is where the speaker will be saying or uttering words or sounds that sound like language, but the speaker doesn't know what they mean. The idea is some entity has come Sorry. inside of their Lucifer. body and this entity is dictating their speech. And so Michael is broken out in tongues, he's barking these words and sounds at Marie and everyone inside of the room has no idea what to make of this. Everything has happened so suddenly and it's so surprising. You have the wife suddenly coming in and aggressively accusing her husband of cheating and Michael is not responding to it and he's acting totally crazy. And then before anyone can do anything, Michael goes from just barking in strange languages at Marie to suddenly rushing across the room as if he's going to attack her. And when he does that, the rest of the members jump on top of him and hold him down. And despite there being like 10 or 15 people holding him down, Michael is still trying to get up and he's screaming and snarling and yelling at Marie. And then Marie suddenly breaks out into tongues too. And it's only then that Michael stops trying to force himself What 
what the fuck is happening? <laughs> what the fuck is happening in this story? Again, my guess is that this is some kind of cult or whatnot. Or at least, maybe that they, they don't know or whatnot. Uh, the rest of them don't know or anything like that. <clears throat> um, this could be an act from everybody to lure her attention away before they take care of the wife. Because it did say, like, what, 27 demons? Like, I mean, that sounds like, you know... No, not 27. 34? I don't remember how many, whatever the fuck it was. Um, and so this could be a Satan-worshipping meeting here. Um, or their silent uh, you know, prayer activities and when uh, they were trying to summon demons or something and uh, one of them got a hold of home dude and he infected her because she seemed like she was scared at first but uh, maybe that was all part of the, the plan maybe she 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 remarked that like you know he said that she would later state that you know he didn't look human and whatnot but maybe she was happy about that information like it sounds like she was like oh he was scared he was scaring me or something but like maybe she actually said that happily it's just like, yes, it, was, it, it finally came complete. He didn't even look human in that moment anymore. You know, maybe it's like one of those scenarios. Maybe them two are, uh, are converging with the devil. Uh, this plot gets thicker and spicier every minute. Self ...up out of this pig pile that's on top of him, and instead he just continues to speak in tongues to her. And so the two of them are looking at each other, speaking in tongues, and the rest of the group is just totally dumbfounded, and so they just begin praying. And then after about an hour, Michael just collapses. It's like he went unconscious. And at that point, an everybody hour? in the room just goes silent. And they Y'all stood around and watched that shit for an hour? Fuck no. I'd be like, we gotta take out the host the demons possess and knock his ass out. Like, I wanna just sit there and be like, let's just pray the spirits away, right? Or pray the demon away. Nah, no, I would've been like, take him out. It's our only hope of survival. The devil's in him. Look at Michael. And then Michael kind of opens his eyes and it's almost like he's waking up and he begins looking around frantically trying to figure out what had just happened. Michael would claim he had no memory of what had just happened to him. The temptation of the devil. That's what happened to you. Uh... <sighs> um, is anyone going to address the fact that she was speaking back to him in tongues? Something going down here. And so at this point, Marie would tell him and Christine that she believed Michael was possessed by a demonic force, and the only thing they could do at this point would be to perform an exorcism. An exorcism is an expulsion or attempted expulsion of a supposedly evil spirit inside of a person or a place. Michael and Christine were at a loss. Yeah, something's going down here. This is not straight up what's happening. There's some there's some twisted shit going on here, and I think that lady, the head of it all, is at the at the forefront of what's going on here. They had no idea what to do in this situation. They were both kind of in shock for very different reasons, and so they just kind of deferred <clears throat> to Marie's judgment and said, "Yeah, you know, I think an exorcism is the way to go." So Christine and Michael just leave the church and go home. I like how after this event. <laughs> She's, she's not even worried about cheating no more. <laughs> she's completely forgot about the cheating. It's just like, okay, woman who I thought he was fucking not a few hours ago. Um, you should definitely spend more time with him exercising the demons from his body. Wink, wink. Um, like, <laughs> how quickly we forgot why we were there. Um... Yeah, no, something fishy going on. Something fishy as fuck going on. And then the wife's falling for it. And then the next morning, Marie would get in touch with the Anglican Church of England and would request an exorcism. And after hearing about what was going on with Michael, the Anglican Church would say, yeah, that does sound like he needs an exorcism. And so the following day, they would send out two of their best exorcists named Peter and Raymond. And so Peter and Raymond, they get to Osset, well, they go to Michael's right. house, and they observe him. And very quickly, they determine that it does seem like Michael is possessed by at least one demonic force. Huh. And so you don't want to hear that. At least one. We hope it's just one. You don't want to hear that. Tell Michael, the only thing we can do here is perform this exorcism, but we need you to agree to it. And so Michael says, okay, yeah, I agree to this exorcism, Ooh, and so would his wife, she. because she at this point is just completely unsure what to do. She's just going along for the ride. So a day later on... Our 
I was like, I don't know what's up with my brain today. Uh, it's just it's just going wild. Maybe it's because I haven't done a Mr. B story in a while or something. I don't know. But <laughs> my brain just running wild right now. It's just they like in this situation, if you're the wife, like, like I would still be suspicious and like I think this was all an act or something. But um, she was there and saw the whole thing, not I. So who knows? It might have been very convincing or like been straight up real. Who knows? But uh, if you're the wife in that situation, like. I bet I bet most of you could agree that like you know you'd be a lot happy you'd be very happy if you, if your if your uh, your husband was just possessed and not getting some strange on the side you know like you'd probably be happy that he's uh, he's possessed and not cheating right it's just gonna be a victory for this will be a W for her right <laughs> anyways let's continue. October 4th at 10 p.m., Michael, his wife, and the rest of the members of this fellowship group, along with Peter and Raymond, they would all meet at this other church in a neighboring town. And as soon as Michael had been positioned in the middle of this group in this chair, Peter and Raymond began the ritual by praying. And as soon as they did, Michael began screaming out in tongues, and he began writhing around, and he fell to the ground, and he began contorting his body in grotesque positions, as if the words Peter and Raymond were saying were physically harming Michael. And so after eight hours of this, during which they had to actually tie Michael down to prevent him from hurting other members or hurting himself, after eight hours, they finally just came to a stop. Peter and Raymond were exhausted. It looked very much like Michael too was exhausted. And as soon as they stopped the ritual, Michael just kind of collapsed on the ground as if he had fallen unconscious. And then at some point he kind of wakes up and he's looking around wildly. He's still tied down to the ground and he's acting like he has no idea what's just happened. And at this point, Peter and Raymond, they tell him that, you know, the exorcism was mostly successful. We identified 40 demons inside of you. No way. (laughs) 40? There was 40 up in there? Like you, bro. If you got 40 demons in you, you know he was fucking that girl on the side. Like, uh, you, you tell him you got 40 demons in you and one of them isn't a, a strong demon of lust. Like, I mean, you know he was getting some on the side. Um, 40? Dude, you got fucking... Uh, I, mean, I don't know if they're going to name some demons here, but... Um, uh, you got uh, Emily Rose fucking beat, I think, on the number of demons you had in you. Though she did have like some like m- like prime demon lords inside her, um, including Satan himself. So like I guess she had str- possibly had stronger ones. Unless we're gonna get some names here, um, but like still forty demons. Like you don't just you don't just walk away from forty demons, man. Like you're probably fucked at that point. And this exorcism was able to expel 37 of them. So that means there's still three demons inside of you. Now, we can't do it right now. We're too tired. You're too exhausted. So go home, get some rest. And tomorrow we will finish this exorcism. We will get rid of those three. Oh, how, how, how do they know? <laughs> how is like, were they doing some prayers? And like in like some angelic Christian tongue Latin, I guess that would be what it is, right? They're asking how many uh, name yourself demons, how many are present. They're just like, oh, I guess they they ask nicely, roll call. Okay, I'm in here. This person's in here. And then they're like, okay, we count to forty. And then just just like, oh, they're saying prayers. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's clearly one's gone. One's gone. Tally that one off. Okay, we got one, two, five. Okay, it was five out there. We we, we were making some progress. How do you know? You got 37 demons out. I'm like, oh, but there's still three in there. I'm, I'm, I'm sure more can't get in. You know, we, we, we gave you a, a holy seal. Like, they can't get back in there. But once they gone, they gone. It's going to take them all to get back in there. So those three the bitches uh, call goods for today. Come back tomorrow. We'll get the last three out. <laughs> like, like, okay, the fishiness is going up to an all-time scale. And plus, it's just like, how, I would just be like, how do you know that? Did they say peace on their way out? It's just like, okay, that was, um, just trying to think of a <laughs> random demon name that's not from Diablo. Uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, that, that was, oh, that was that person. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> that no name's coming to me. That, that, that one's a, that was a big one. Yeah, we got that one out. Cool. Bye. Yeah, fuck you. Go back to hell where you belong. Yeah, I guess it'll be downwards. Yeah. Uh, it was demons, and you will be just fine. And so Michael and Christine they get their things and they leave the church and they head home. A few hours later, around noon, a woman who lived near where Michael Taylor and his family lived thought she heard something strange outside of her house. It sounded like someone yelling. And so she went to the front of the house and she pulled the curtain aside on one of her windows and outside, walking down the street, completely naked, covered in blood, was Michael Taylor. Oh, he done killed his wife and beat her blood. Yeah, man, if like, if, if you're exercising demons and there's still three in there and they're just like, holy shit, they just like clean house on all my our demon buddies in here like you going they're gonna clean us up tomorrow let's have some fun tonight like you know what you know what i mean like you know something bad gonna go down he probably should have been watching homie he should have been in some like like should have locked him up in some holy cell somewhere you know what i mean like what are what y'all doing he was saying something about Satan. And so this woman, she calls the police. The police show up and they find Michael. He had curled up on the sidewalk outside of this woman's house and he was giggling like a child in the fetal position. And so the police approach him and at some point Michael apparently snaps out of it and he starts looking up at the police like he has no idea what's going on. And eventually... I think the dude's just a good actor, man. <laughs> I think he's faking all this shit. They would get him to tell them his name and where he lived. And so after calling in backup to deal with Michael, the responding officer... We still have not addressed the fact, and it's almost over, that the other girl... As I said, the other girl was talking in tongues back at him, right? Like... I'll have to rewatch that. Maybe I misheard. ...made their way to Michael's residence. And so they go inside, and immediately, as soon as they see what's in there, one of the officers just turns around and runs outside and begins dry heaving. The inside of the Taylor oh, family... It's gonna be floor-to-ceiling blood, Doc. ...family home would become one of the most infamous crime scenes in English history. Mm -hmm. A few hours earlier, when Michael and his wife had come home from the exorcism, they had gone inside, and then Michael had fallen into one of his trances and began beating his wife. And then at some point, she fell to the ground and either was dead or was in the process of dying, at which point Michael jumped on top of her, and using only his hands, he ripped her face off and flung it across the room. And then as she's laying there, bleeding to death, yeah. he began rubbing yeah. her blood all over his body. Yeah. And then after she had finally died, he tracked down the family dog and killed the dog as well. Why did the dog have to go? Why always in these horror movies the dog got to go? What's up with that shit? Fortunately, their five children were not home at the time of this attack. <laughs> Very fortunate. And so they were unharmed. During Michael's trial, the prosecution and the defense... Where were his five kids at? I guess they probably were like some see they're going to be gone all night. Like, was that... Uh, um... I was like sleeping over at a neighbor's house or something like that. Blamed the Anglican Church of England and Marie and her religious group for effectively convincing Michael he was possessed with demons, which caused him to act out violently and kill his wife. And so ultimately, Don't Michael would be this. found not guilty by reason of insanity. And after only four years of psychiatric care, he was released. And today, he is still living free in Osset. But despite the legal outcomes of this case, there are many people, both religious and not religious, who believe the Michael Taylor case is one of the only true demonic possession cases in modern history. Also, just to close the loop, we don't know for sure if Michael and Marie were having an affair, but it is assumed they were. They were so fucking, dude, you know it. And so that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, I saw in the comments someone talked about the, the secret, but then I didn't go too far because I, I was like, oh yeah, Mr. Ball, these comments will probably spoil something, so let's scroll back up. Uh, like, dude, they were so fucking. Like, yeah, everyone knows, every every single person in the world knows they were fucking. Like, that, like that's guaranteed. I honestly don't, like, I honestly... I thought that was going to be crazier. I thought there was going to be some cult thing going on. I thought they were going to be worshipping Satan or something. And they were summoning demons and something went wrong. You know what I mean? Like, But uh, I don't... I don't... I don't believe it. I guess that's why demon is put in quotes. You know what I mean? But how nerve-wracking does that have to be? That uh, homies... Yeah.
Help me lives around you. It's it's like the uh, the end of uh, Secret Window with Johnny Depp and whatnot. Um, to where it's like everyone like knows what this person did, but like you know he's still living among them. And whenever he shows up, they're just like, uh, "This guy, he's gonna kill one of us." You know, that's got me uncomfortable. Uh, but like, come on, man, like. <laughs> God, man, like, homie was definitely fucking, his back was against the wall, and he just went for an angle, you know what I mean? He he definitely went for an angle. I don't think there's anything wrong with him at all. Because, like, again, how, religions, all like that, how did they know that there was 40 demons in them? Like, there was 40 demons in you. They roll called and everything. We knew their exact names and how, the exact number, how many there were. We knew there were 40, and we got... 37 of them's out like they, they we would count them off as they went pew, 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 back to hell you know like well, come on man like i don't believe that for a fucking second <laughs> dude was just playing the field and you know he he he, he got caught and he found it out and it was just like oh, i'm possessed and stuff but like i still feel like we need to go back to that part or it said like she was speaking in tongues, right? Like it said something about that. Hold on, give me, give me a second here. Let me, let me find this. Come on, motherfucker, play. At Marie, with this very, the speaker will be saying what they mean. The entity is different and sounds happened so suddenly, and it's so surprising. And Michael is not responding to it, and he's acting totally crazy. And then before anyone can do anything, Michael goes from just barking and attack her. And despite there being like ten screaming and snarling and yelling at Marie, and then Marie suddenly breaks out into tongues too, and it's okay. So I was, I, I did, I did hear that right. Ain't no one gonna address the fact that Marie started speaking in tongues. Ain't no one said shit about that. And then she was just like, she was like, oh yeah, you're possessed by demons, but I'm cool. Like, oh his his demons like lashed out at me, and I felt it. I spoke tongues a little bit too. Marie was in on that shit, man. Like they was. They was doing some shit in the back room when everyone else was gone. They were they were drawing pentagrams, sacrificing a goat, and having a blood, uh, killing a goat, pouring the blood all over them, and fucking in a blood orgy in the back room, man. Like everyone fucking knows it. <laughs> and then like you know when they got caught, he was just like, oh, I'm, uh, tongues. <laughs> And she saw what he was doing and was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a good play. I'll go along with it. Uh, tongues! Uh. <laughs> She's like, oh, he's possessing me now. Fucking nah. They were they was fucking. They got caught and they found it out. And that's why she was just like, clearly he's possessed. We need to get an exorcism. I gave a fat tip to the priest. He's like, I think there's 40 in there. Oh, there's we got 10 out. We're, we're doing something. Nah, man. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> bullshit I call baloney on all of that then they got caught fucking and they found a way out and then he had to kill his wife and you know make it as gruesome as possible so he could go with the not only insanity plea but like it was it was the demons the demons got into me like yeah yeah you know they still meeting up in secret come on even after four years and stuff like they still fucking bet bet money right now. They still fucking to this day. Anyways, <laughs> that's gonna do it today. Um, I can't really remember what the first story was. Right, the amnesia thing. Uh, I mean that's just fucking weird. There's no. Uh, we'll go through our lessons checklist. Lessons to learn here today. Um. <clears throat> Uh, first one, there's no real lessons to learn. Just like that's just a crazy, fascinating story. The second one, uh, it's not really any lessons to learn <laughs> except for you know, if you're about to to uh, you know jump from any kind of height, um, where you need uh, to be strapped and harnessed and all that and good stuff like that. Like if you're gonna skydive or bungee or anything like that, when they say you're good to go, like no matter how panicked you are, you should definitely turn around. Like you sure, right? Everything's good before you jump um so that's that's one lesson but you know uh, she wasn't paying attention she was she was too freaked out and whatnot which 
Gotta give her credit, man. Mama didn't raise no bitch. I know that's double negative, so technically she did. But like, it's funner. It's more. It's more funner to say it that way. So, Mama didn't raise no bitch. Um, so like, huge props. Uh, to her, for like being like, nah, I ain't no pussy. I'm gonna fucking jump off this motherfucker. You know what? Mad respect to that woman. Like, uh, hell yeah. And. <sighs> Man, both of them, her and her boyfriend, were good looking. Man, it was sad to see them go. Uh, him, her go. Uh, he, he, he. I don't know. I think he could have dove for it, but uh, the other lesson is if like, if you're in a place like I don't want to shit in other other locations and stuff. You know, not everyone can. You know, like poverty is a real thing, and there's poverty stricken areas, and it's horrible, and we should do something about it, but, like, I don't know, the world's selfish, so we don't, so there's, like, really run-down areas and stuff, and I'm sure there's quite a few places in Colombia that aren't. Um, that place looked, uh, like, a little bit, not too bad, but, like, a little bit, you know what I mean? So, like, like, if you're living in a location like that, like, you know, Anywhere that's like kind of run down, maybe a little bit like ain't got like you know all the safety precautions and stuff that some countries do have. Um, then like, like maybe don't do life threatening stuff. Now, apparently, it seems like it would have worked. Me again, I wouldn't have fucking done it because that was, in my opinion, not far enough distance to jump, even though that hundreds of people were surviving it <laughs> like every day. That still was way too close of a location. The pullback on that looks like they got maybe this close every time from just smacking their face in the top of the bridge. Like, fuck no. I wouldn't have done it. So, uh, if you live in a place that's maybe not on the up and up when it comes to safety and caution and uh, just stuff not being destroyed, um, just, I, 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 Bungie wouldn't be the first thing I would do, I would say there. Uh, and the third one, like... The only real lesson, because, like, I mean, lessons if you're cheating, how to get out of cheating, I guess that's one way to do it. If you're cheating specifically with a uh, with a uh, church leader, uh, that's one way to do it. Be like, uh, Satan, Satan possessed me and made me fuck her. Like, I guess that's, that's a lesson you can learn. That's one way to do it. Um, don't recommend killing or cheating, but, like, you know, the world's crazy. I guess that's a way out. Um... But uh, the lesson that could be learned in that one is from the wife. And a few situations there. One, if you think if you think your husband cheated, you don't bust in to the prayer group with everyone there to be like, "You cheating motherfucker! I never should have trusted you." You know, Tiger Woods. Um. Uh. What you should have done is kind of hide them on the side of the building, wait for everyone to clear out. And be like, all right, they're having their silent prayer. More like the thump, thump, <laughs> thump, thump, skeet, skeet prayer. Uh, then you bust in and catch them in the motherfucking act. And then you have proof. You run out before they can retaliate on you by like locking you in and killing you. Um, and uh, file for a divorce, get uh, get the safety, get the fuck out of there, and take that money. That's what the fuck you do. Um, you don't just barge into them when you're outnumbered, um, and be like, "Sharad, you are. I have proof. Admit it in front of everybody, because then they're gonna start speaking in tongues and like gonna kill you and stuff like that. Just, you don't want that. And secondly, if you just went through. An hour of watching him on the floor being held down, barely held down by ten people, and uh, if you see him be all exercised and stuff, and they're just like, "Yeah, they're not all out." Like you don't, you don't sleep in that person's um, bed that night. You don't go to the same house as that person that night. You um, you be like, "All right, someone locked this motherfucker up." So he's safe overnight because I don't think these demons are going to be chill with you being like, all right, you three are next tomorrow. And they're just like, oh, shit, we only have so many hours. We got to do something. Nah. <laughs> like, you don't you don't risk that. So uh, you go sleep at a nondescript area so that no one could find you. Um, hey, your husband can't find you. 
and you get that motherfucker locked up somewhere like hey can we put him somewhere and keep close guard over him until we can perform the uh you know somewhere holy so if she starts acting up you can save him in the middle of the night no nah, man nah like yeah that's another lesson you can learn there you don't trust that level of demons so uh yeah yeah Thumb, thumb, skeet, skeet. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Uh, I gotta see what I'm gonna do to cut down the editing of that and for future ones because I think we're probably like an hour ten around here and whatnot. So, like, probably as long as it would have been, anyways. But well, it would have been a little shorter. We're probably close to 50 to 60 minutes. But, like, I don't want every single one to have an extra like 10 minutes of dialogue on it. So, I'm gonna find a way to maybe, like break that down or something like that. So, yeah, but seriously. Like be uh, be adults out there. If something's not for you. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't have to harass and uh, be a horrible piece of shit human being and throw hatred at people who do the stuff that you don't agree with. Um, people are gonna do stuff you don't agree with in life. You need to be the adult and walk away. Okay. Thank you for joining me, Mr. B. I love your stories. Fantastic storyteller. Uh, if you haven't done so already, seriously, go uh, go. just hit him up with some views. Just go to his videos and push play all and just have it running on your computer when you go to sleep or one night. Like rack, but rack up his views so people can stop complaining about other people stealing views from him and stuff like that. Like, like hook your brother up because Mr. B deserves it. He deserves all the money in the world for his awesome skills and whatnot. So thank you for joining me here today, and I will see you all next time.